So here we are, Clark Hall, the venerable landmark in Port Credit, is 100 years old, uh, uh, A.R. Clark Memorial Hall. Uh, and joining us to uh, explore the story of Clark Hall is local Port Credit historian Richard Collins, who might know more about the ins and outs of Clark Hall than any other person that I, that I know about. Uh, Richard, can you start off with who the heck is Clark? Alfred Russell Clark. Uh, yeah, he didn't even live in Mississauga. They had a, uh, he and his wife had a, a cottage in Warren Park. And in the summer, uh, they would stay there, I guess, all summer. So they would go to the local Methodist church. Uh, so they didn't know the community, and they, uh, they considered uh, uh, Mississauga to be home to them. Uh, but he was uh, a leather goods manufacturer in Toronto, apparently fairly affluent at the time, successful businessman. And... Um, and so they uh, they would just spend their summers in in uh, in Lauren Park. And uh, one year, he decided that uh, he felt that in order to promote Canadian businesses in the UK, he was going to get a bunch of Toronto businessmen together, and they were going to go over to the UK and try and sell their products there. Tell people in Britain that hey, Canadians make good products. It used to be the other way around. Canadians used to always buy things from the British. Let's try and reverse the trend and show people that we can make good products to sell to them. So we got about a hundred businessmen in Toronto and they were going to go over to the UK to sell uh, Canadian products. And uh, so uh, Mr. Clark arranged all the, all the arrangements to get them there. He uh, booked the, the trains to get them from Toronto to New York. And then from New York, they got onto the ocean liner that was gonna take them across to the UK. And uh, long story, slightly less short, uh, they ended up getting on a ship called the Lusitania, which is an old ship that had taken several hundreds of voyages up to this point. It was just another ship that was leaving uh, New York Harbor, but that happened to be the ship that uh, didn't quite make it to England. It got uh, just off the coast of Ireland. This is 1915, so World War I is on, yep. and uh, the Lusitania is hit by a, a, a torpedo from a German submarine, and it sank. And... Uh, Oh, 1,200 people went down, 800 survived. So it wasn't like a total disaster, although 1,200 people was quite tragic. And E.R. Clark was one of those that managed to survive. He got on a uh, on a lifeboat, but he had been bobbing up and down in the frozen Irish Sea for uh, about seven hours, I think. And this is April, so it's cold. And the Irish Sea in, in the North Atlantic is always cold all the time. So obviously at that time, he was to caught pneumonia. And a couple of weeks later in a hospital in London, he died. And so that's the story of Alfred Russell Clark. Uh, but the main story really is who is Mary Louise Clark? Uh, she's uh, she's kind of really the central topic here uh, because it was uh, Mary Louise that had the A.R. Clark Memorial Hall built to honor her husband a few years later. And that all came about when the, uh, the church next door, which is now First United, where it's... Uh, First Christ, they just recently changed its name again. Uh, they needed to expand. Uh, their uh, congregation was getting bigger, and they decided the best thing to do is to move their Sunday school to a separate building so that everything else could be used for, for the actual church services. And the minister said, we need to raise money to build a new hall. Uh, we just purchased the land next door, and we need to build a hall. And uh, they raised, a, a, uh, I think they said they needed a book. $8,000, can imagine building Clark Hall for $8,000, but that was money at the time. And they raised about two or 3,000 of that from typical what churches do, bake sales and uh, bazaars and things like that. But they still fell about $5,000 short. So lo and behold, one of the members of the congregation, which is Mary Louise Clark, floated the other $5,000 to get Clark Hall built. Uh, and so they formed a trusteeship and she became the uh, chair of the trustee that ran Clark Hall from 1923 up until the 1940s. What I found most interesting, and and, and so th there we have the you know the the inspiration behind Clark Hall, uh, or A. R. Clark Memorial Hall as it's officially called, um, but uh, it was built in a couple of stages. And what we see is kind of that, and, and we'll talk about the the 1925 front because I know there's a mm -hmm. some curious architectural styles too that what everyone sees. But what you don't see is the Clark as it was originally formed in 1923. That's kind of tucked behind the more ornate front. Uh, I, find, I I didn't realize that until we started recently looking at the history of this building that for a couple of years there, it looked a little different than it looks today. It looked a lot different. I was surprised at first too. I uh, I thought it was all built at once. 
But sure enough, going through the records, I don't inadvertently found out. I kind of knew that the hall had been built in the 1920s, going way back, just general court credit history. And it wasn't until, oddly enough, in 2023, very early in the year, that I got thinking, uh, I forgot I was going to do an article with the court credit BIA. Sometimes I'll do articles for them and sometimes with Eric Mississauga. I can't remember who it was. And then I started doing the research. I think it was January, maybe like January 15th or something. Yeah. So I realized that the 100th anniversary had literally just been a few days before uh, I started doing some research on the property. So I got the word out to Heritage Mississauga and the Mississauga South Historic Society. We should do something and celebrate the 100th anniversary. And yeah, going through all uh, the old newspapers, I saw this drawing that was in the Toronto Star that it didn't look anything like what we think of Clark Hall and L. And I realized it was the actual hall itself. The If you go inside the hall, you see the slope roof that you can see kind of looks almost like a hockey arena yeah. in a way. And uh, yeah, that the hall itself where most of uh, the events take place, that was the hall. And then it wasn't until, I guess, some of the money they raised in the first three years of renting the hall out, uh, they had enough money to build the office building part that's in the front. And that's the distinctive facade that we recognize today. But it's about three years younger than the rest of the hall. Yeah, I found that I found that uh, a fascinating thing where you think of the hall as this big open space, but then this front addition was added on, which really provided office and classroom spaces. Um, but let, let's talk about that front addition. What everybody sees today is this... Uh, very interesting eclectic mix of uh, styles that really amount to no singular style. I, I love uh, when I do tours and people talk about architecture, people like to put labels on houses that say it's Georgian or Victorian or uh, international or art deco or whatever. And uh, other people can look at the same building and see something quite different. It's kind of like this modern AI facial recognition where two computers will see the same face, but they will try to reproduce it in different ways. Uh, it can be frustrating, and with Clark Hall, yeah, it's hard to put a label on it because it's all sorts of weird designs. So weird things we don't know who the architect is. Right. Uh, I've looked and looked and looked and can't find anything, and I tend to think that maybe at least, uh, if not the architect itself, the person that was in charge of guiding the architect's hand was probably Mary Louise Clark because she comes across to me as quite an eclectic lady herself. And the building styles, there are uh, Roman columns, and usually Roman columns will hold up a pediment or something towards the top. In this case, the columns just go up and they don't hold anything up. They just seem to be there for a decorative reason. They don't seem to serve the visual purpose of holding a roof up. And they've got these Spanish uh, clay tile roofs, which are quite interesting, but obviously there's not that much of a, a Spanish history to early port credit. So why she went with that design, I don't know. And then you've got these, uh, quite in contrast, you have these round arch windows that are kind of very almost what Americans would call the Federalist style, because they didn't want to call it Georgian style, because George is a British king. Uh, yeah, with little keystones that, again, don't seem to be keystones for any stones that come off to the side. So it's just yeah, all sorts of weird architectural elements that uh, should make the front a disaster, but it's actually quite quirky. So that's why I love the building so much. I would say eclectic or quirky are good words for the building, but probably also reflect the that uh, multifaceted identity of Port Credit itself. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we're a quirky little <laughs> town, so maybe that's why we like our building so much. So one of the things that, uh, yeah, I mean, early on in the history of it, we, you know, we obviously know this is a building that has been used for community gatherings since it was built. Um, but also at one point there was basketball being played here, um, which I, which I, I find rather humorous. It was a movie theater time. Talk a little bit, just in brief on the role of this building in kind of the uh, over a hundred years in, in the social life of Port Credit. Uh, yeah, I think it was originally intended just to be used by the Methodist Church, uh, which is now First United, but it was still the Methodist Church at the time. Actually, it was Methodist Church when the hall was built, and then by the time the front end was put in three years later, the Methodist Church of Canada had become part of the United Church of yeah. Canada. They united with a lot of Presbyterian churches. Uh, yeah, so it was there for their use, but I guess they found the, uh, they didn't need it all the time, and so eventually... Just came to be a public building that you could rent out for if you wanted to have a wedding ceremony there. A lot of public meetings, a lot of political debates over the years, even still going on. Yep. A lot of contentious community meetings about uh, development, uh, even in the 21st century. Uh, yeah, uh, the high school used it for a while before they got their gym built, and it was used. Imagine the kids having to come all the way over from uh, where Mentor College is now, but that was Port Clay High School uh, at the time, and the kids had to walk a few blocks to get 
to the college. At one point, when Riverside Public School uh, was overcrowded before they added their first edition in 1954, uh, kids were having classes in Clark Hall. It just seemed to be this all-purpose, whatever you need us for, uh, we're here for you. That's kind of what Clark yeah. Hall was saying to you. And for a good portion of its history, and it's a little bit obscure, but uh, in 1941, uh, the, the hall transitioned from the ownership of the United Church to the town of Port Credit, and then served as town hall uh, for Port Credit and for council chambers up until amalgamation at the end of 73. So uh, can you talk a little bit about just how that, the I guess, the, the building has evolved uh, a little bit over time? Yeah, they had a, uh, the town hall was in a small uh, I would call it a shack, but like a small building on State Bank that's long gone. Uh, again, it's hard to imagine how even uh, just a little village like Port Credit could have run out of such a small building. And I guess, yeah, the, the, uh, the United Church at that time was looking to, to sell the building because it was costing them money. And so the, the village of Port Credit purchased the building, uh, probably at a good price, and obviously didn't want to see the building go because it was such a use for building. So it became the town or the village hall, I guess, initially, although it was still mostly used for meetings and debates and dance hall movies. It was still a public building. It's just that the village used the office buildings in front. Uh, there was a, a, a traffic court in one there where you could go to pay your hydro bill to the uh, to the local utility or your water bill. So it just came a, a nice all-purpose building right. from 1941. And then in 1961, when the village became the town of Port Credit, and so it, it didn't have a trusteeship anymore. It actually had a formal mayor and councillors that you voted for, and they had formal council meetings there. Uh, that became the town hall. So it became a symbol of Port Credit's independence, another reason why the locals loved the building so much. Uh, yeah, so it was just a, uh, and then of course, yeah, it didn't really serve much of a purpose after 1974 when Port Credit and Streetsville were amalgamated with the town of Mississauga and it became the city of Mississauga. And then the city hall moved to a few office buildings up by square one and then finally our familiar city hall was built so uh, post amalgamation uh we kind of see that reverting back to the community programs community uses the town the the the, the um uh, the corporate structure of the town of Port Credit ceases to, to use the building town of Mississauga or city of Mississauga takes it over uh, again reverting it to its its base use of a, as a community center, a community hall. Um, the MSO, the Mississauga Symphony Orchestra, was one of its first uh, long-term tenants uh, in, in the building. When did when did uh, the MSO come in? Yeah, 1974, they were formed. So they just had their 50th anniversary this past year. Their, their 2022, 2023 reason was their 50th anniversary. Uh, so yeah, 1974, they moved in and, and they were there until they finally moved to the Living Arts Center and 1997, I believe. Yep. So almost 25 years, almost uh, a long time. And that's where their head offices were. Uh, it was their administrative offices, but it was also where they had rehearsals. Some of the office rooms were used as rehearsal space because right from early on, the MSO was interested in uh, promoting local talent because the, the, the symphony orchestra today is still mostly amateurs. They're not paid musicians. There are some, but right. most of them are just Mississauga residents that uh, have talent and they want to be part of the symphony. And so they were smart and thinking, well, we if we're going to keep now 50 years later, if we're going to keep this uh, orchestra vital, we need to constantly be encouraging young people and, and train them. And so, yeah, what they called the String Institute was there and they, they would do occasional performances on stage. Uh, but yeah, they used that almost exclusively as their head offices for a long time. Uh, and there's still offices in there now. The Port Credit BIA was there for a while. There's a couple of groups that are in there now that use it to, uh, uh, for offices so it's yeah. always been used but yeah we noticed when we were doing some research on the actual events that were taking place it seemed that kind of when the city took over now uh, Clark Hall just became one of a number of uh, a fine arena community center complexes around the city whereas when it was in Port Credit it seemed to be the one place to go and right. it was always busy and we had a hard time finding things that were going on from the 70s into the 90s yeah it's just because it kind of uh, it just became another building and where you used to have you know all sorts of important political and, and historical events that were taking place there it had kind of become a place where you were having uh auctions and rummage sales not that these are bad things it's just that they, uh, they were just kind of smaller one-time community events so there was like in any good story like any good movie where your second act is kind of when your hero 
is at the bottom of his, uh, uh, before he climbs up to, uh, to become the hero at the end of the movie. Clark Hall does have its second act downtime when it's uh, kind of being abused and ignored. And I think it's starting to come back now as people begin to appreciate this is just a great building. Now yep. it's 100 years old, wonderful architecture and really a great place uh, along the main street. Well, as I say, at the very least, it's a unique space in, in the city of Mississauga, uh, a, a, a true heritage gem and a landmark. So uh, I think, you know, just the fact that it's 100 years old, but it's 100 years old tied to the community life of Port Credit in Mississauga. Uh, I think, that, like you said, countless events, uh, gatherings, uh, what, what do you call uh, wedding receptions, uh, yeah. you know, have been held here over, over the years, not to mention even just the live music ven venue, Windmill Theatre was in here. I just, I think they're, you know, remarkable uh, venue for the life of the, of the, of Port Credit and Mississauga around it. Uh, and that it's still here. It's still part of the community and you know, like a hundred years old and still going strong. So I think, you know, there's yeah. something said for that. With that, with that, I just want to say thank you. And uh, I know you've gathered more history on the on the building than others. And uh, uh, it's a remarkable story. And I invite people to share their memories and their stories of Clark Hall with us. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, chapter two, the next two, next 100 years. Next 100 years, yeah. <laughs> It'll still be there. It's a solidly built building. It'll be there. He's made a brick. <laughs> <laughs> Not port credit brick, though, I don't think. It's hard to tell. It, it uh, although it could have been because Port Credit Brick was there till 1927, but uh, yeah, we've never had a chance to pull a brick out to see whether it's local brick or not. Maybe we should do that for 100th anniversary. We should have a ceremonial uh, chipping out of one of the bricks and taking a look at it and see if it says Port Credit. <laughs> right. and the, port, the, the brick works was just a not even a block away. It was just the underside of Mississauga Road, half a block away. Yep. Yep. Okay, so with that, thank you, Richard. Um, enjoy the 100th anniversary. And anyone listening to this, uh, again, uh, next time you buy, uh, drive by this venerable old landmark, uh, give a, a, a tip of the hat to it. It's been around. It will continue to be around. And it's a remarkable part of our, our city's story. Mm -hmm.